9 a.m., 14th of October, the battle begins. How did the illegitimate son of the Duke of Normandy become King of England? Do you see the confusion? Hello, welcome to Hattie Talks and welcome to Turn Back Time Tuesdays. This is where every Tuesday I will be talking about a historic figure or a historic event that particularly interests me and I hope it interests you guys too. If it does, please like and subscribe and also turn on the post notification bell and also, if you can, um, comment and let me know if you have any requests that you'd like me to talk about. Today we will be talking about William the Conqueror. How did the illegitimate son of the Duke of Normandy become King of England? England was made up of multiple Anglo-Saxon kingdoms which was united in 927 by Ethelstan to create the Kingdom of England. Vikings, however, still reigned terror over England and this caused a rift between Normandy as Normandy was allegedly being used as a Scandinavian base for the attacks. I'm now going to quickly talk about um, the kings just before William the Conqueror so that you get an idea of who is who and also what England's relationship was like with other countries at that time. In 1013, King Ethelred, the Unready, fled and took refuge in Normandy because King Swain of Denmark had driven him out of England. Swain then died a year later and Ethelred returned but then also died not long after. Canute, Swain's son, in 1016 then became king and even took Ethelred's widow as his wife. Canute then died in 1035 and the throne was passed on to his son that he'd had with his first wife, Harold. Harold being the son, not the first wife. England was still very unstable and when Harold died, half the Canute, Canute's son with Emma, Ethelred's widow, then became king. Now Emma had also had children with Ethelred before he died. So when half the Canute passed away, Emma's son with Ethelred became king. And so King Edward was crowned in 1042. Now you need to remember him for a little while because I'm gonna be coming back to him. But before we do, uh, I'll talk a bit more about William the Conqueror. William was born in 1027 or 1028, they're not really sure. Um, and he was the son of the Duke of Normandy, Robert I, and his mistress, Her Lever. Her Lever. Her Lever. I don't know how to pronounce it. This gave him the nickname uh, William the Bastard, which unfortunately stuck with him for life. And he felt that this was a very degrading name and he didn't really like it, but nicknames will stick. Despite being illegitimate, William did become Duke of Normandy after his father died. Robert I, his father, died after he went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and passed away on the way back. William was seven or eight at the time. This meant that despite the fact that he was Duke of Normandy, he was actually too young to make any decisions and his advisors and those around him took advantage of that and abused their power until William could really stand up for himself. In late 1046, a rebellion sparked against William and this led to him taking refuge in France with King Henry. King Henry then helped him take control of Normandy again um, through the Battle of Valedunes. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, I wasn't very good at French. So sorry if it isn't. Please let me know in the comments how I meant to pronounce it. This battle was a turning point in William's career as the Duke of Normandy. However, it was by no means the end of his struggles. In 1052, his once friend, ally, role model, King Henry of France, turned against him, which was probably motivated um, by the idea of gaining dominance over Normandy and therefore becoming more powerful. Battles and invasions occurred until 1060 when King Henry of France and his ally Count Geoffrey died. It was their deaths, along with William's marriage to Matilda, the daughter of the Count of Flanders, um, which really helped him gain control and power over Normandy. A fun side note, there is no evidence that William was unfaithful to Matilda, which is very unusual for those times um, and of a man of his power to not have had a mistress or two. Um, 
However, he didn't. Okay, going back to England. In 1051, King Edward, who was childless and remained so, chose William to be his successor. William's granddad, Richard II of Normandy, um, was actually Edward's uncle. So it wasn't completely surprising that he chose a relative, whether it be distant or not, to succeed him. This is actually one of the facts that blows my mind about William the Conqueror, because I don't know about you guys, but for me as a child growing up and learning about history, I was always kind of led to believe that William the Conqueror was this evil invader who took over and had no right to do so and blah 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 blah, despite the fact that he is actually the ancestor of the kings and queens to follow. Um, I was just always led, I was always taught that. Um, and it actually blows my mind to think that actually he actually was the rightful successor to the King of England and he was actually just kind of claiming it, um, which I know he went about it the wrong way. I know it was a violent um, thing and lots of people died, um, but in reality that wasn't that unusual in those days. Um, and so why is it that he's known as the Conqueror um, when actually he was just succeeding the crown in the rightful order and just had to fight for it a little bit, which is what most kings and queens have had to do at some point um, in, in the olden days. So, I don't know, it always just confused me because I was like, oh, so he did actually have a right to the throne. I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think that's weird? Comment it if you do. <laughs> like I said, Edward was childless, but he was married to Edith Godwin. Edward and his father-in-law originally had quite a positive relationship, um, but things soured and his father-in-law was eventually sent into exile and all his titles and lands were taken away, as well as all of Edith's brother's titles and lands were taken away which can you imagine is a bit awkward. Like imagine your husband banishing basically your whole family from England and just sit there like, oh, bye guys. Peace was eventually restored and all of their titles and lands returned. And after Edward's father-in-law died, um, Harold and Tostig, his sons and Edith's brothers, uh, they actually gained more power and they became earls. In 1064, William secured his power over Maine and also destabilised Brittany. Also, side note, you know I just mentioned that Edward's father-in-law's sons became earls. One of them, Tostig, he actually, he was Earl of Northumbria and Northumbria actually rose up against him and he actually had to flee to Flanders. Embarrassing. So 5th of January, 1066, King Edward of England passes away. Now, no one is quite sure what happened on the deathbed. Um, however, there are claims that Harold, his brother-in-law, um, was declared his successor, despite the fact he'd already promised that to William. Do you see the confusion? The next day, and I mean literally the next day, Harold is crowned king. They waste no time. And I think the reason they waste no time is because they're very aware that William will be on his way to declare that he is actually king. And, and I think it's just kind of a race to who gets the crown on his head first. And Harold was in the same country, so. Now Tostig, the one who Northumbria rose against and then fled, he actually came back because he wanted to claim the throne as well. He actually arrived on the Isle of Wight, which is my home, um, but he received very little support from the English people and so he actually had to then flee again. Harold wasn't really worried about his brother, um, but was very worried about William and so he anticipated an attack and he rallied together an army and a fleet 
William was also making preparations and he put his wife Matilda in charge of Normandy's affairs uh, while he was preoccupied with taking over England. In late September 1066, William and his fleet set off for England. This was actually delayed, it was meant to leave earlier on, but due to bad weather it had to leave in late September. Harold, Harold had forces lining the coast, but he actually called them off in early September, which kind of meant that England was easy for William to enter, which is a crazy bit of luck on William's part. Was it luck? Was it not? We don't really know, but I think it was probably luck. Now, September was a very busy month for England in 1066. Tostig had returned to Northumbria and sparked the Battle of Stamford Bridge, in which Harold killed his own brother. And it was just three days later that William's fleet landed in Pevensey Bay. They then moved east and built a castle in Hastings and just kind of waited for Harold to come to them. They weren't in a rush. You, you come to me. And Harold didn't seem to be in a rush either because it actually took him a week to get to them. Which, to be fair, it's a, it's a long way from um, Hastings, Northumbria to Hastings. Harold actually attempted to use the element of surprise against William, but William had already been informed that Harold was nearly there. So that's a bit embarrassing. 9am, 14th of October, the battle begins. William had cavalry and archery on his fleet, whereas William had cavalry and archery, whereas Harold seemed to only have foot soldiers, and if he did have any archers, they were very few. At first, Harold's army created a shield wall, and this led to a lot of casualties on William's side, and some of them actually fled. After seeing um, some of William's men retreat, some of Harold's soldiers actually followed them and chased after them, um, but that actually led to them being captured by William's cavalry and killed. And during this time, there was actually a rumour that the Duke himself had been killed, um, which is obviously not true, but they didn't know that at the time. After seeing how Harold's soldiers had chased them and then died, um, William's army actually faked two more retreats um, and the same thing happened. Harold's soldiers didn't really learn the lesson. They chased after them and then were attacked and died. And according to legend, Harold, at some point in the battle in the afternoon, um, was shot through the eye with an arrow by William himself and died. Now we think this is true because of the Bayou... Bay... Bayo? Now we think this is true because of the famous Bayo tapestry um, which depicts it uh, and it also a later adaptation of that also shows the arrow just going through his head so we I mean we think it was one of those two the next day, Harold's body was identified using his armour or the marks on his body um, and William's army actually took it away, uh, whereas Harold's own brothers were left on the battlefield, like dead. I forgot to say they died. They died. A lot of people died. Harold's mother actually offered William the weight of her dead son's body in gold for the return of the body so that they could properly bury it and lay him to rest. But William actually refused and ordered the body to be thrown into the sea. But we don't know if that happened because other people claim that it was buried in secret. So after the battle, you might think, oh, well, William is now king, I guess. He killed his opposition, but no. The English decided to give their support to another claimant of the throne, even though they didn't actually like him very much, um, but they preferred him to William the Conqueror. Um, and so William slowly began taking over Dover, Kent, Canterbury, Winchester. Eventually he marched into London, burning and destroying as he went until 
the other claimant and the clergymen around him submitted, surrendered, and William was crowned king on Christmas Day in 1066. Whew, what a story. So now he is king, and obviously there's a lot more that happens throughout his reign, which I'm sure I'll talk about in one of my other videos. If that's what you'd like, let me know. Um, but for now, I'm going to leave it there. I hope that you have enjoyed this video. I feel like it's going to take ages to edit because um, I feel like I've just sat here and rambled on. Um, so, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. That's how William the Conqueror became King of England. Yeah. Have a lovely rest of your Tuesday and the rest of your week. Um, I hope that you're well and safe and don't forget to like and subscribe and also share to your friends if you think that they'd like this if you know someone who's particularly interest in, interested in history um, send them this way and we can all chill out on Tuesdays and have a little chat lots of love everyone I've been Hattie Talks see you soon see you next week this is actually one of the facts that blows my mind about William the Conqueror.